Okay, uh, welcome back to Aussie Author Bros. I'm joined by uh, Irish Orthodox blog, uh, who is Rory. Um, yeah. So today we're going to talk a little, just a little bit about um, essentially orthodoxy in the West, but specifically we'll be focusing on Ireland and the British Isles. As you can tell, he's from Ireland, uh, so <laughs> that's his uh, sort of interest. And so very briefly, just a uh, bit of context, I guess we'll get a little bit of background on yourself and on your interests and why you do what you do. Uh, and I'll just let you talk for a little while. Sure. I mean, my relationship with orthodoxy began because of uh, a very, very well-known book, Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future by Faber Sarah from Rose. I assume you probably knew that one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was the first one that uh, really opened my mind to orthodoxy. And I came upon it because I was searching similar books by these, uh, but of all different religions, that was sort of where I was before. Um, I don't know if you know the school of thought called traditionalism, yeah. which would be Frischoff, Shuyon, Rene Gannon, these kinds of people. So... To sum up that position, they have a respect for what they define as tradition, which is something very uh, broad and now I think actually very sub subjective as well. Um, and therefore, I had an interest to study any religion, really. And I happened to come across this Favre Sarah from Rose book, really thinking nearly before I I'd read it, that he was like them, that he was one of these sort of uh, someone who had explored a tradition, become an expert in that tradition, and, and also had an equal respect for all the other traditions. But for anyone who's read that book knows it starts off totally not like that at all. Yeah. And so that was a, a surprise to me and also made me realize that I had really skipped over orthodoxy. And I think the reason for that, which is probably happens with a lot of people, is they see uh, the modern modern Protestantism, um, modern uh, Roman Catholicism, especially after Vatican II, and then have a sort of negative perception of Christianity in general from that. And then in, in their spiritual journey will often go way out like outside of christianity entirely normally towards buddhism and hinduism first uh is what happens with a lot of people they sort of jump over orthodoxy because of that negative view um and, and that's really what happened with me and after having to sort of gone through hinduism and buddhism and and islam and you know basically yeah, all the different religious positions and then i suddenly realized i've overlooked this entirely whenever i started to look more more into it you know uh obviously i was convinced that it was true and more than that that it was the only one that was true mm -hmm. you know that all, all all the other religions were either breaking off from it or were you know maybe like a foreshadowing of it in some way and, and that, Father Sarah from Rose was a big part in the, uh, convincing you why there's only really truth in one religion rather than um within all yeah. this assortment why you can't hold a perennialist position essentially yeah um so that was the book that sort of cracked my previous worldview yep. and uh yeah, that's how I began. Obviously, I read other books uh, by him and, and also the big uh, biography about him by Not of this Harold world. Hmm? Not off this world, this one here. Um, could that could be the title of it? The I don't know because I read it off so PDF. Yeah. I'm not even because I didn't have the physical book, yeah. I can't even right. remember the title, but that must be the one, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how I keep the, the first thing that brought me into orthodoxy, I would say. But then from then, obviously, uh, I visited a local church and uh, met the people and, and became a catechumen um, last summer. Mm -hmm. 
and look look forward to being baptized soon. Yeah, fair enough. Yes. So, onto our main interest of the video. Thank you for your um uh, introduction of yourself. So, so the real interest of this video, I I would think, is um essentially that we want to talk a little bit about uh. Well, I guess is this rediscovery of orthodoxy in the West, right? And we want to rediscover our heritage as well. I guess, especially if you come from a more traditionalist type of uh, thinking, it's a, there's a lot of, about um, rediscovering our heritage. And so, for example, what you're doing on your uh, Irish Orthodox blog uh, channel, there's uh, good stuff about how we had these early Orthodox saints uh, in Ireland and in the British Isles. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, yeah an, an important thing to... Uh, emphasize from from that is uh, essentially obviously it wasn't just within ireland and england but uh these places are called holy ireland holy england uh essentially they're sort of in, in the same way that russia was called holy Rus, right uh because of the way of life of all the people there and it's sort of um more dedicated towards god as a whole i'd say and for example you see this in the big monastic communities so definitely within Ireland and uh, England, and that the sort of life was structured around uh, the uh, faith, just the, for mm -hmm. different people, if you um, uh, sort of understand what I mean. Um, yeah, so I think uh, just rediscovering our Orthodox heritage in the West can be a very helpful apologetic uh, for uh, people who, are, who sort of have this idea of, um, well, for example, let's take a Protestant view. Uh, like we had early church, however, however long, what, whatever you say, for example, maybe 100 AD I don't know, or Council of Nicaea, right? And then after that, your apostasy and then your Protestantism, or you have a Roman Catholic idea. Everything's just been Roman Catholic forever. So I think, um, which within a Roman Catholic view, for example, like development of doctrine, even then, um, I guess we could uh, contest that a little bit, like even then that it's not even had the same necessarily theology expressed in exactly the same way either, which is, and then, uh, which is of course can uh, be a bit of an issue uh, when uh, debating with them because they'll say that like uh, the uh, theology has developed. Uh, but if you can sh show sort of fundamentally that the Orthodox and the uh, uh, Catholic way of a, uh, for example, monasticism with St. John Cassian as opposed to um, current Roman Catholic practice or with or the Ordo Theologiae of St. Hilary of Poitiers. And so there's um, uh, Joseph Farrell covers this in his book, uh, <clears throat> which I'll link a, uh, something to the Energetic Procession blog uh, in the uh, description which covers this auto theology where essentially you don't start with the uh, uh, consubstantial essence of God. That's not the starting point within orthodoxy. So if you can show these fundamental differences within both sort of the praxis and the theology uh, of saints in the West prior to the schism, I think we can then present a good case for orthodoxy. Right? Yeah. Um, and so just to make that point clear about why St. Hilary, for example, and St. John Cassian are so important is because uh, in, that was before the invasion of the Franks, so it wouldn't have been called France then, it would have been Gaul, but it was those monasteries that especially gave Christianity to Britain and Ireland. Obviously, whenever you think of a map of Western Europe, those are the places that, that Gaul is geographically the closest so naturally it, Christianity came through there uh, from the south up to the north and then on into Britain and Ireland well unfortunately uh, my brother's not here today he is uh, busy but um I think he's also knowledgeable on I, a couple of Greek saints who um, went over to uh, England as well from Byzantium I think Saint Theodore um, mm -hmm became an archbishop in the British Isles and I think so there's a lot of uh, influence from the east within the British Isles and their conversion I think um, yeah the, the, the a real key in that is um, St John Cassian because 
he was in Egypt for decades and in many ways is a, an Egyptian desert father before he moved to Gaul. So you see actually Egypt seems far away and like something that you would think is not, not relevant to Britain and Ireland. But via him as a link, actually there's a very direct connection with Egypt, uh, for example. Um, which obviously skips out Rome, although people did also go to Rome, of course, from the Orthodox position in, in these times. This was long before the schism in the in the fifth century, for example, when Ireland became Christian. Um, and also uh, an important figure is St. Martin of Tours, um, who was very much inspired by the monastic style of St. John Cassian. So again, it's a, you could call it an Egyptian style of, uh, or spirit of monasticism. And he was especially venerated in Ireland. They had the, the life of St. Martin of Tours, and so many people went to uh, visit his monastery. And there, there was a clear idea of taking that model and transferring it to to Britain and Ireland. So this is it's a very, very direct connection. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's quite interesting. Um <laughs> I'm obviously not as well versed in uh, sort of this Irish stuff as you are, which is obviously why uh you're 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 doing your thing um very focused on Ireland. Mm -hmm. It's quite um quite admirable that you've got this knowledge. Um yeah, I agree. This is a uh, this sort of stuff really if you dig into it, I guess, really shows this uh strong connection between really the east and the west and uh, the development of the west is uh prior to say for example the um papal invasion in 1066 of england um, mm -hmm. you get uh a lot of english uh, and irish saints uh they're all much more sort of orthodox in their praxis and um and in their theology than uh than uh they would be considered roman catholic i guess yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, um, I would say about 1066 that it's not something that I've started to look into in depth. Um, in the blog, I'm going, you know, chronologically through history, and now the focus has moved from the 6th century onto the 7th. So 1066, I haven't really started to go into that in, in, in depth at all yet. Um, but it is my understanding, yes, that this is a, a definitive shift in the in the history of of england um that it was even uh something backed from the papacy and this as well is um repeated in in the case of ireland in the 12th century uh again an invasion of the normans and again backed by the papacy there really was an idea that this is a church not under our control and then with the with the Normans, there there is an agreement where there this sort of works for both sides. One is a military and political uh, invasion and, and victory, and the other as get, gaining control over those uh, churches. Mm, yes, yeah, I think um, yeah, it's uh, very important to uh, emphasize sort of this history of how we get this change within, especially the British Isles, is they're sort of obviously an enclave from the rest of Europe in a, in a manner. And so they were sort of shielded from the effects of the schism for a while, for, for a very little while in the case of uh, Britain, I guess, but even like, for example, leading up to the schism, yeah. they would have been shielded from some of that as well. And yeah. even then, I think not just i think we don't need to just talk about the east influencing the west i think we can also talk about the west influencing the east for example i believe uh that for example saint alfred the great uh, he had a lot of writings and i think some of those writings even are uh, from the people who fled england um after the norman invasion i think uh, from recollection that in fact some of his writings actually ended up influencing the Rus, for example and so um i think not just we can we influence emphasize that the east for example the cappadocians the desert fathers those people that they influenced the west and especially i guess the british Isles. but 
that that the sort of West has a genuine uh, theological and uh, practical um, heritage that is useful for people in the East as well. Like the writings of these fathers are like we shouldn't just be stuck reading the writings of the Cappadocians, for example. Um, and so, in a way, it's not just uh, that we're in some sort of apologetic sense recovering it, uh, this heritage just for saying, oh, look how traditional we are, but that it offers a genuine um, trove of spiritual wisdom and knowledge as well. So, Absolutely. obviously, this is a very important project to, uh, I guess, recover orthodoxy within the West. <clears throat> and so, yeah, so I think it's it's good if uh, more people would uh, look into, say, saints from, well, obviously, there's a book called uh, Saints of England's Golden Age by Vladimir Moss, um, who is uh, who is a uh, true orthodox, but um, it's still a good book um mm -hmm. and it has i believe it has for example some services in it um the for some of the saints from recollection might oh, like, a, like an archivist to the saints i think not just archivists but even like vespers and liturgy yes yes i think um i'm i'm not sure i haven't read that book but i knew that a lot of this does survive yes uh, there's, uh, there's also um lots of uh, resources on the internet having these services as well and i think uh you might be able to remember who it was who said that uh when england starts remembering uh their saints again that um they'll be, that england will become orthodox I, I can't remember which saint it is uh, i so. i actually have it written down i can tell you exactly <laughs> because i was thinking that this quote is so important for a talk uh, this is it. The Orthodox Church in the British Isles will only begin to grow when she begins to venerate her own saints, and that was Saint Arsenius of Paros. Yeah, there we go. So, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very, very important uh, quote. And, um, and yeah, it's not something uh, arbitrary, of course, because it, it's definitely the Orthodox faith is very much reliant. Of, I'll rephrase the the orthodox development and growth of our um, faith within just ourselves, like our own individual persons, is reliant on, in a big part, reliant on those who've come before us, those who've finished the race, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, at the end of the day, it is all up to uh, God, uh, essentially. Uh, but since god works through his saints um we this re reconnection with our heritage because this is a specifically western heritage right and the cultural context is different i guess the cultural context in the west is different now than it was a thousand years ago but still sort of some some uh, connection remains and so for example unless you're someone who's like into traditionalism or someone who's like quite intellectual or philosophical for example you're not going to be reading all these uh cappadocian fathers for example mm -hmm. uh, i'll just bring them up again um because uh it's too much effort i guess whereas if you can sort of if you can see that you owe your heritage at the moment to these saints for example if they really built up even just the fan, even like what's distilled in, for example, in uh, Anglicanism, uh, mm -hmm. what's distilled from the saints there. And you can see, well, maybe this is where the good parts have come from. And you can see right. that really you have a direct connection to these people, or these saints, mm -hmm. then, then it is, uh, then you can learn off them. And uh, obviously we try to learn off all the saints, but naturally we're yeah. going to, gravitate towards people who have sort of from our own area our own culture etc and yeah, obviously okay. um something my brother likes to talk about is uh the connection of cult to culture which is um uh something that maybe i'll get into him with him about a bit more at some point but uh if you've got these um these saints then that's where the culture comes from that's where you sort of get a more uh, coherent and stable culture, whereas uh, which is another reason why perhaps 
remembering and commemorating these saints will allow our a stronger cultural core to form for example which means that uh say for example it means that your children will be able to raise be raised in a more christian environment within a community of christian people orthodox christian people i mean and so not just about um mission work but also about the future of your own children right uh, which is which I'd say would connect back to that Saint Arsenius quote. If I just as a sort of a off the cuff sort of thoughts about it, and I don't know what what would you uh, have to say about that? Yeah, you touched on on a lot of good points there. Um, I think there is something nuanced in you know what you could call some some kind of a of a patriotism, mm -hmm. where obviously in orthodoxy it, to we do. Uh, transcend our nation in some way because we're focused on a kingdom of heaven and not a kingdom of earth and of course we do venerate the saints of of all countries uh, but at the same time we don't completely wipe out any sense of patriotism and it is very natural and, and for example these countries that are majority orthodox russian people do for example tend to venerate russian saints yes. first and foremost and then other well, saints as well. and similarly with greece and romania the, yeah, there's some the of, of all saints saints of whatever like each country yeah. celebrates that commemoration on that day for their own country, right? Whereas, right. for example, mm -hmm. that can be a bit strange to say, I'm here in Australia and I'm commemorating all saints of Russia. I mean, there's not really any many saints uh, who have been or come to Australia. So, mm -hmm. I guess, in a practical sense, it might not make as much sense. But, for example, in the British Isles, it would be quite easy to commemorate all saints of the British Isles. And I think a few, quite a few parishes do that, but... Yeah, so um, again, just another point that uh, it can be a bit weird to commemorate all saints of some country that's way over there, right? Yeah, yeah. And of course, in, in the case of Australia, uh, its history is more profoundly affected by Britain and Ireland mm -hmm. and not so much by, by Russia or Greece, <laughs> for example. And uh, in this way, the connection to the saints would go naturally via Britain and, uh, and Ireland in, in this way, as that sort of sense of nation, because also in regards to uh, its place, obviously one of the, the big modern movements for us to uh, fight against really is those forces of globalism, which are trying to erase that sense of nation which also is associated with an anti-christianity and uh th those two things tend to go together really anti-nation and, and anti-christianity and so in, in in this way i think this the saints the veneration of our own saints is a is a very important and balanced way to oppose that where it's not uh, like a commitment to a kind of patriotism that, that blocks out other nations, but at the same time, it's not rejecting your own your own uh, history, your own nationality, all of these things. I think something interesting on the topic of like owing our heritage to the British Isles and the Orthodox, well, British Isles, sorry, a bit more in Australia. I think another way, another interesting thing on that topic is right. I'm not 100% sure how this is in England and Ireland or even Scotland, for example, where currently there's a sort of re rhetoric, right? We've got a Pentecostal prime minister right? mm -hmm. <laughs> who, has, who barely implements Christian policies, I'd say. And you've got this idea that because it's opening, openly Pentecostal, somehow we live in a Christian totalitarian state, right? Which is ridiculous because... Firstly, it's not totalitarian. Secondly, I would I would really hesitate to call it Christian at all. Or yeah. perhaps Scott Morrison is deeply Pentecostal, but it doesn't um necessarily show in his uh politics so much. But um if you look back to Holy Island and Holy England, 
uh, and these great kings, for example, St. Alfred. Um, mm -hmm. You can see how really the this culture can um, create such a, uh, how we can create such a culture, right? How we can sort of get back to this golden age of Christianity where that that's what that's what the christian totalitarian regime looks like right it's not <laughs> it, it's a it's such a silly uh, rhetoric piece of rhetoric because obviously <laughs> those weren't totalitarian regimes either but um yeah so in a way we yeah, can't just return you know. to uh their practice and their theology but we can also return to their societal manner in some yeah. way of speaking we can uh, mm -hmm. learn from how these especially the island and england and because there's only th uh from from what i know there's only three sort of peoples that were called whole had like the prefix holy x like holy england holy Ireland, and holy rus so mm -hmm. i think especially in the west there's a big lesson to be learnt from these places yeah especially for example either like america australia anywhere that got colonized by england for example because mm -hmm. a lot of our culture would come from those uh sort of distilled down and i guess you can trace that all back to this properly christian culture so in in order to sort of really emphasize this idea of what a christian culture should look like rather than um random uh, random secularist uh propaganda essentially yeah yeah because obviously the saints are like models very high exalted models for what our lives should be like you know obviously we fall very short from it but that doesn't mean that it's just read for for entertainment or something like that it's read to uh, well, one of the reasons for it is to give us this clear model for how to try to shape our, our lives in that direction. And so similarly, in these countries where that produced many saints in certain centuries, it's not only the individuals, but you, you do see that, that they're set in this larger context, like you said, of a fully a uh, Christian society. With some of the um, founders of monasteries, I'm sure it's the case in um, England, Scotland and Wales as well, um, but I'm not sure, but for for in Ireland, for example, St. Finian of Clonard, that these started as monasteries, and even now we have an idea in our head of how a, how a monastery is with even a large monastery with so, so, so many monks. But there's a fascinating term that's used for these places like Clonard, a monastic settlement. Because what happened was the monastery grew in size so much because so many people wanted to become monks uh, under an excellent, uh, a saintly abbot, that it grew in to such a massive size. Clonard, I think, had about 3,000 monks at a certain point. Um, and then what happened was there was lay people who maybe, for example, they were married, so they couldn't, they couldn't become a monk. Um, but they wanted to be near it. They wanted to know yep. the monks. They wanted to provide service for the monks. And so around the, the monastery was like in the center and then around it grew this even larger settlement. And yeah. then maybe some people came just for, because so many people lived there, maybe they just came for trade. But, you know, basically an entire city really was created with the monastery at the center. And then obviously with some people, maybe they would c come with the intention of trade, but then end up becoming monks themselves. And, th you know, that's I I incredible to consider that. And you see how Christianity was not something compartmentalized to these people. Yeah, um, exactly. It was, it was whole... individualistic as well. Mm. And that's why it was called Holy Island because it's, mm -hmm. it's yeah it's not just the monks um yeah, yeah so i think <laughs> we're sort of drawing to a close um i might let you say a couple of closing words and then i'll give my final ideas 
Sure. Um, I'm just seeing, is there anything? Um, no, as final words, I would just say, um, obviously turn people towards the the blog that I have on the, on the YouTube channel. I, I think it is a good way to get started. You know, part of the reason why I, I started those things was because I didn't see uh, a blog like that or, or a YouTube channel like that. I think this is quite a new field of research in a sense. Uh, these things from the Orthodox perspective, uh, you know, and I think that is a good place to begin on the blog, especially I'm trying to get, the, there's so many documents. I think for myself, I underestimated it so much. And I think most people would underestimate how much you can read from those centuries. And I'm trying to put that also, it's not just my writing on the blog, it's, you know, the writings of these saints and about these saints. So, um, yeah, that, that would be my my closing word, truly. Really. Yeah, so I'll just say a couple of things quickly. So I think, yeah, so essentially our main focus was how recovering Orthodox in the West can be a very, very helpful thing, both for growth, both for our future children, but also missionary work. Uh, thing being how this actually has a very, it's very relevant to the creation of Christian culture, which is uh, something John and I will be talking about soon. Um, I'd just like to thank you, Rory, for coming on. Uh, yeah. This was a good chat and um, uh, God bless you all for, thank you for listening in and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. And perhaps uh, Rory and I can uh, collaborate again sometime. You let us know. Sure.